Welcome to First Envy Church. We're so glad that you're joining us today. We have just a few things to share with you before our worship service gets started. It is so important that we find ways to be connected to other people during this season. If you visit firstmbchurch.org slash online groups, you will find some options that might work for you. We have prayer groups, Bible studies, life groups, all on that page. Tonight at 6 p.m., there's a new life group starting. This group will be working through a study called Why Jesus. This is a great, safe place to work through any questions you have about who Jesus is, what it means to follow Jesus, what the Bible has to do with anything. So if this sounds like it would be a good fit for you, visit firstnbchurch.org slash online groups, and that group is at the top of the page. This past week, we launched our new temporary food pantry ministry to help serve those in need in our community because of this pandemic. Many of you came by this past week to drop off dozens and dozens of food items, gift cards, and toiletries to help serve these people. And we are so, so grateful for those of you who came and have already helped with this. So thank you very much. If you would like to help with this project, it's not too late for you to get involved. This next week on Monday and Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., we're having another drop-off day where you can come by the church building and leave your donations, and we'd love to get them distributed. All you have to do is come in the office entrance of the church building right by the playground. We'll have a table right there where you can leave your donations. You don't even have to see, talk, or touch anyone. We'll just leave your items there, and we'll make sure they get delivered. And we have a website set up at firstdmechurch.org slash food pantry where we have a list of suggested items that you can bring, things like bread and canned goods. But we're also encouraging you to bring things that your family enjoys. Maybe there are certain snacks that your kids like that other kids probably would like. We'd love to have those items as well. So again, you can learn more and get all the details at firstdmechurch.org slash food pantry. And also, if you find yourself in a season of need right now or someone in your family is struggling to meet these basic needs, we'd love to help you. So there's also a link on that same page where you can just click and let us know that you need some help and we'd be glad to help you during this season. Thanks again for joining us today. We're excited to start a new teaching series and we're so glad that you're here with us. So now let's get started with worship. Good morning. Welcome to our services this morning as we celebrate together our risen Lord and Savior. Things are going to be a little bit different this morning as it's just myself and Cindy at the piano. Many of you are sitting at home, some of you by yourselves. And as you sit there this morning, you might think, it's not important whether I join in or not. But it is because you have the same audience there that I have here. We have an audience of one this morning. You may not know some songs. You may not like some songs. You may not like something that happens. But yet, what is important is that we have the audience of God and God alone this morning with us. As I stand here and I look around the room, I have the same audience that you have at home. So sing with me, read scripture with me, pray with me this morning. It's not a concert, it's a time for you to become involved in the worship of our Lord and Savior this morning. Oh God, our help in ages past. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Beneath the shadow of thy throne, your people live secure, sufficient Stood for earth from darkness. 
Read with me these words from Psalm 145, beginning in verse 8. And be reminded this morning that even in the midst of trials, tribulations, of problems, of God's goodness and greatness, he is there with us, walking through this time with us. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. shelter in the time of storm, secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter time of storm, a shade by night, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm, no fears alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat. A shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary shelter in the time of storm day by 
thy day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all daughters that were killed in a tragic sea accident, only survived by his wife and another child. But many of us don't know what happened after he wrote the words to it is well with my soul, which he wrote as he took a ship across the ocean and came to the spot where his daughter's ship had gone down. About 10 years or so after this time in his life, he and his wife moved to Israel and opened a, almost like a Christian commune that they called the American Colony. Eleven other members from his church joined him. And over the next several years, there was about 70 people joining him from Sweden. And then another year or two later, another 90 people joined him. Much too large for the house they were in. They found a house that had been owned by a Turkish prince. And he had died suddenly. And they purchased the house from him, moved in there. 
And this place became known as a place of peace and a place where people could go for help if they needed it. Today, that place still exists. It's known as the American Colony Hotel because back in the early 1900s, I believe it was, somebody had come there needing a place to stay and they opened up the doors to him. Today, the family still sits on the board of that hotel and they still continue to operate the original house which has become a place of comfort and respite and succor for the children who live in that area. They continue to minister because he refused to let the trials, the great sorrow over the death of his daughters stop him from serving God but sought how to use that to minister to other people and to make a difference in other people's lives. Let's sing together. It is well with my soul Satan, though Satan should buffet, no trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed. Father, we are so thankful that no matter what we go through, that it can be well with our soul. We are so thankful that you were walking with us through each valley and over each mountaintop. We are so grateful for your care for us. Even today, Father, when we're scattered and joining together via technology, that you are there with us, sitting right beside us, walking with us, that you're protecting us, and that, Father, we can know that today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day, that it is well with our soul. Father, we just pray that you will continue to be with us, use us in this world to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. 
so that others may know this assurance that we have walking with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Art. So do you have it <laughs> or not? I mean, can you paint or draw or dance or sing? Can you do pottery? Can you do sculpture? You know, it just seems that people either have art or they don't. They can make beautiful things or make things beautiful or they can't. Um, so the first mention of artists in the Bible is in Exodus 31. And there it's part of God's instruction to the Israelites to build the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was the portable church or meeting house. And it would be used for hundreds of years before King Solomon built the brick and mortar permanent temple in Jerusalem. Now this tabernacle, there was a a holy building itself. It was 15 feet wide and 15 high and 45 feet long. It was a narrow, long building and that was where the holy things were done by the priests who would go in. But around that building was a courtyard and it was marked off by a large pole and fabric fence. It was seven foot high and it was 75 foot wide, 150 foot long and very ornate. The building and the fence and as part of that instruction we first hear the word artistic. So in Exodus 31 verses 2 to 6 it says and this is the Lord talking to Moses. Look I have appointed Bezalel son of Uri Verse three, I have filled him with God's spirit, with wisdom, understanding, and ability, and every craft to design artistic works in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut gemstones for mounting, to carve wood for work in every craft. So Bezalel, the first artist. And then I have also selected Aholiab, son of Ahizamach, to be with him. I have placed wisdom within every skilled craftsman in order to make all that I have commanded you. Artistic ability comes from God. Did you get that? He placed that ability in people. If you are able to make beautiful things or make things beautiful, that comes from God. And God is the supreme artist. I mean, no one comes close to matching his creativity, his aesthetic ability, his ingenuity. He created this planet and this universe in all of its glorious detail. God is the supreme artist and he has chosen to plant a part of his artistic ability into at least some humans. Now, I'm not an artist, not even close. I. Uh, I took an art class in college hoping to get an A. That didn't turn out so well. But still, over the years, as I have tried to explain various Bible principles, I've ended up scribbling designs and pictures and things on napkins and pieces of paper to help explain the principles. And over these next six weeks, I'm going to bless you. Okay, I'm just going to show you some of my, and I'm using the word loosely here, some of my art. I'm going to be drawing pictures for the next six weeks. Pictures that will help illustrate practical principles. Now today, I'm going to talk about marriage. Now I know that not all of us are married. Statistically, about 90% of people will end up getting married. Those that aren't either have never been married or are yet to be married or they're widowed or divorced. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about marriage today. Now, do you know what this is yet? 
That is not a, not a TV with an antenna. It is something better than that. Uh, these are three flower pots to illustrate three different kinds of marriage that I want to share with you today. So I hope you will remember this picture and the beauty of it. So there are three kinds of marriage. And the first kind of marriage that I want to talk about is what we call the selfish marriage. And here, two, two flowers, two people, they fall in love, they get married, they hop in the same pot, they live together, they spend time together, they love together, they might have kids together, but at some point, the selfishness of one or both of the flowers begins to dominate. Now, all of us are selfish. You're selfish, I'm selfish, every human is selfish. But in the selfish marriage, one or both of the flowers is dominated by a deep selfishness. And one says to the hey, you've changed. Oh, well, you're always mean to me. Or, oh, look at that flower. Or, your petals are dripping. Or, oh, and at some point, if you spend enough time in the selfish model, the selfish pot, you're going to end up in divorce court. Now, I, I speak no judgment here. I know that divorce is not the unpardonable sin. I know that Jesus gives reasons that people can get a divorce. So there's no judgment here. I'm just saying that if you spend too much time there, you're going to end up in divorce court. I even recognize that sometimes the person who files for divorce isn't the most selfish of the two. They've wanted to save the marriage, but it, it couldn't be saved. But that's the selfish marriage. The second kind of marriage is called the contract marriage. And what you need to think here is marriage license that you sign or you need to think vows in front of God and these witnesses till death do you part. Now this is a mediocre marriage. They're not, he's not beating her. She's not out having affairs. That would be more of the selfish model, right? But this is just two roommates. They're not killing each other. They're going to last till their 50th anniversary, but it's not a good marriage. It's just mediocre. Now, these two, they fall in love to do all that, but they have drawn a line in the sand, and that line says, over our dead body, are we going to get a divorce? I mean, they just made that commitment. We might not get along. We might fight a lot. We might not have the best marriage, but we're not going to get a divorce. And I think God, he looks at them and he, part of him at least, wants to applaud and say, way to go. Like, let your yes be yes. And you stood in front of those people and said, till death do you part. Way to be a couple of your words. So I think there's some applause from God for even mediocre marriages to hang in there and to say, hey, we're not going to get a divorce. But I think part of God is also looking at these couples in the contract flower pot and they're saying, he's saying, you know, you're idiots. <laughs> he's saying, you know, you're, you, there's so much more to a marriage than what you have. Why are you settling for this? It's kind of like the two-door Honda Civic hatchback uh, Joan and I had when we moved here 15 years ago. I always joke that my little Honda there, it had power nothing. It didn't have power brakes. It didn't have power steering. Uh, the windows, hey kids, there used to be cars where you didn't have a button for the window, but you turned a really fun crank and it turned the window down or up. But we didn't have a radio, no cruise control. And I think God is saying, you know, if you stay your marriage here, you might get to your 50th anniversary, but it's not a very enjoyable ride. There are so many more cars that are so much better with GPS and dual 
controlled thermostat. She wants to be warm. He wants to be cold. You're both happy. And there's, there's bun warmers. There's even bun coolers now. And there's crews and everything's electric. And, and you can get to your 50th and the ride will be so much better. The third kind of marriage is called one flesh. And um, this marriage is two people. They fall in love, they hop in the same pot. They live together, they love together, they spend time together, they might have kids together. But in their mind, philosophically, they see themselves as grafted together. See, my beautiful artwork here, two flowers that have become one. Another way of illustrating this is two lumps of clay. You've got the, for the, for the guy, you've got the blue, and then you've got the pink for, the, for the, the lady. And if you take those two lumps of clay and you slap them together and you twist it a few times, you can see the dark streaks of blue and the streaks of pink but they have become one. There's not a human with a scalpel on the planet that can separate what has been made into one. This is one flesh. It's philosophical, it's theological, it's spiritual. Certainly it's physical, but it's more than that. This word or this phrase, one flesh, comes from Genesis chapter two. And there it's around where Adam is created and then Eve is created out of Adam. And Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she came out of man. And then it has this line, therefore a man will leave his father and mother and he will be united with his wife. That word united in the Hebrew, it carries with it the idea of stick, of glue, of cement, and they will be cemented, glue, they, together, and they will become one flesh. Now, the one flesh marriage has not drawn a line in the sand that says over my dead body will we get a divorce. They have drawn a line in the sand that says over my dead body will we have a mediocre contract marriage. That's the only difference. They have simply raised the bar of expectation on things like me, second place. Like, I'm gonna put you above me. This is stuff like humility. It's things like apologizing and uh, forgiving quickly. It's things like asking for help. I mean, you can, you can sacrifice your marriage on the altar of your, your pride or your embarrassment and not go to a friend and say we're, we're struggling, not go to a counselor, or you can humble yourself, you can own your junk, you can forgive, you can ask for help. I mean, this is the kind of one flesh relationship that brings such joy and peace and security and satisfaction. Now, for Joan and I, we're going to be coming up to year 35 of mostly wedded bliss this summer. And Joan can fact check me on this, but I would say that for our almost 35 years, we probably, I'll go 80%. We have spent 80% of our marriage in one flesh where we put the other one ahead of us where we are of humility, apologize and forgive and ask for help and you know, if I added another one, willing to change. You know, we're really willing to do that. But that means we've spent 20% here. Thankfully, Joan and I have spent 0% in the selfish. Now we're really selfish, but we've not camped out in that pot. Now this might look good, 80%, 20%. But if you do the math, that means we've spent, I think, seven years in mediocrity. Like, what's with that? We're we're driving around in a rattle trap car. We're going to make it to our 50th. But the ride hasn't always been very enjoyable. Here's how it works. You can flip between these 
in a matter of minutes. So if I have a harsh word toward Joan, I jump down to the contract model because that harsh word is not me second or humility or asking for help. It's not any of that. But I can have a little argument with Joan and four minutes later, I apologize, she forgives, and I come back, we come back here. So you can go back and forth any number of times on a given day. Or you can spend an entire day here, or a week, or a month, or a year, or you can spend a lifetime here. But no one is going to be 100% in the one flesh marriage. Okay. One more thing about how these three flower pots and marriages work. Maybe you've heard and seen these lazy rivers at water parks where they have a current that's flowing. And the point is, you just kind of bounce a little and the, the current carries you. Or you hold on to an inner tube and it just slowly floats you. Now the Bible is clear that people are born with a propensity to selfishness. We have all as people inherited Adam and Eve's sinful nature. We just have this natural drift towards selfishness. And, and that's what the lazy river is. You just breathe and you begin to drift toward contract or selfish. You see, air quotes, every single couple starts their marriage here. Every single couple starts here. Oh, I'll put you first. I'll be humble. I'll apologize. I'll ask for help. I'm willing to change. I'm going to do everything I can to draw this line in the sand because I don't want to have a mediocre marriage. I don't want to be contract. Everyone starts here. But do you understand how intentional you have to be when the current is coming at you just to stand in one place? You have to brace yourself just to stay here because of the current. You begin to step and not pay attention and all of a sudden you're drifting. This is partly why in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says be alert and self-controlled because your enemy is always there. My, my hope and my prayer is that three simple flower pots, not very good artistically, but three flower pots will help us who are married to look in the mirror and say, which one am I in? Have I drawn any lines in the sand? How willing am I to, to own my junk and apologize? How humble am I? Do I really put my wife or my husband first ahead of me? And I am willing to do whatever it takes. Okay, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. Now I want to take a little shift in our, our talk this morning. One of the things about marriage in the Bible is that it is in part intended to illustrate God's love for us. And so the church is actually called the bride of Christ. And that is the love between a husband and wife is intended to be a reflection of the love between uh, God and, uh, and us. And, and so when we look at the one flesh relationship, we say, how do we describe it? And what are we gonna, so I wanna highlight Colossians 3, and then I wanna tell you a story from Hosea. So in Colossians chapter three, it describes, it, it's not about marriage, but it really describes one flesh, and it describes this love relationship that humans are to have, and it also hints at God's love for us. So this is what it says, Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on heartfelt compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's all this kind of stuff, right? Put on all that stuff. Accept one another, think marriage, and forgive one another if 
if they have a complaint against you, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, put on love. And when I read this kind of thing, the, the words that come to mind, not only for marriage, but for God toward us is one flesh, but these two words also. Limitless love. And my hope and prayer is that in our marriages, we will have limitless love for each other and we will exhibit this bonding, this one flesh marriage that is full of such joy and contentment and peace and security and safety. So for the rest of our time, I wanna switch gears as I mentioned and I wanna tell a story about God's love for us and his limitless love and his desire to be grafted to us. It's the Old Testament story of Hosea the prophet, and it has to be the strangest love story ever told. Uh, So here's how it starts, and I'm warning you, this is a strange love story. Hosea chapter one, there God tells the prophet Hosea, go, marry a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, Israel is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So God is saying to Hosea, Hosea, I love Israel even though she's chasing after other gods. And I want you to illustrate my love for them by going and marrying a prostitute and loving her despite her unfaithfulness to you. Can you imagine this? I mean, God's saying to Hosea, hey, Hosea, go to, the, go to the shady side of town after dark, and when a, a lady in Leah leopard print tights walks up to you in her high heels and asks you if you want some company, ask her to marry you. <laughs> like, who asks a prostitute to marry them? Well, Hosea does because he's trying to illustrate for Israel how much God loves Israel despite her unfaithfulness. And so they get married, and Hosea and his wife, Gomer, end up having three kids today, three kids. And maybe Hosea thought that if he was a good husband and provided a stable home, that that Gomer would quit her night job and that she'd stay at home and be faithful, but she wouldn't. She kept her night job. She kept going up at night to the shady side of town. And I wonder how many times did it Hosea look at Gomer and say, tonight, honey, come on, tonight, can you just stay home with me and the kids? Can, you just, can we just be a family together? And I wonder how many times she said, well, I'll just be out for a while. I'll come back. But then she didn't. And then I wonder, Did the kids ever ask, hey, dad, where's mom at? And what did he tell them? And what were the neighbors saying? And yet, despite her brazen unfaithfulness, Hosea continued to show limitless love. And he threw his heart into trying to do the one flesh thing, and it wasn't working. Not one bit, but he was trying. During one particular season, Gomer had been gone for a while. And God tells Hosea to go and find his wife and show her that he still loves her. And as Hosea tells the story, so he's speaking here, he's writing, Hosea chapter three. The Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Hosea talking. So I bought her. Did you you hear that? I bought my wife for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will behave the same way towards you. 
The Bible doesn't give us details. But Hosea had to go find her. Maybe he asked around and finds out that she's renting a dingy apartment on the bad side of town. And he wanders over there and there's a guy that won't let him up the stairs. He says, well, I want to go, I want to go visit Gomer, my wife. Come to find out this is, his, this is her pimp. And he has to buy his own wife from the pimp. I mean, when it says, buy her, I bought her. He had to pay somebody, right? And so he buys his wife back and we never find out. He knocks on the door and I imagine that she thinks it's just the next customer. She opens it and there her husband stands, but he's not yelling, he's not screaming. He just looks at her and he says, honey, can you please come home? Can we just be family? Can we be husband and wife? I will be faithful to you. Please come home. We actually never find out if she came home. We never find out if she did come home, if she stayed home. But the rest of the book of Hosea, chapters 4 through 14, are Hosea's sermons to the people of Israel. Of course, he confronts them for their adultery, you know, for their rebellion against God. But he also implores them to come home to the God whose love is limitless and who says, I will always do my part to keep us in this kind of a relationship. So a couple of lessons about marriage and then we'll look to God. But first marriage. I'll just say it. Fight for your marriage. Fight for it. Don't give up. I, I try to walk in people's shoes and I can't always do that. Uh, walk in people's shoes who's, who have been working on this for years. Their husband has been unfaithful and they've tried counseling and the husband tries it and then bails on it or vice versa, whatever the case. And the, the reality that there are so many Christian couples where one of the spouses is wanting to pour their life into the limitless love, one flesh relationship at, that God wants marriage to be and their husband or their wife isn't throwing an ounce of energy into it and they feel like they, they're ready to give up and they've been running on fumes and they're hopeless and it's helpless and I don't have a lot of advice for you, and as I said earlier, I know that there are times when divorce is okay, and God says okay, but I'm just saying, can we just fight for our marriage? God is not going to hold us accountable for someone else's behavior, but he will hold us accountable for our behavior, and can we do the right thing and try to fight, fight, fight for our marriage? Part of fighting for our marriage has to do with raisin cakes. You know, I, I read about that in chapter three and I said we'd come back to it. Well, we're back to it, the raisin cakes. So in that day, they would, I don't know, throw some flour and egg and whatever together, throw in some, some raisins and they'd either boil these cakes or they'd, they'd cook them, they'd bake them or whatever, but they would both offer them to their foreign gods as an offering, the raisin cakes, and they would eat them as well. And in, in Hosea chapter three, there it says that they loved their raisin cakes. Part of fighting for your marriage is facing your own raisin cakes. I know your rebellion, it's, your, it's what you're doing, it's your bad attitude, it's your hidden habit, it's your apathy, it's your thinking, I know I should probably apologize, but she didn't apologize last time, so I'm not apologizing this time. But we all have raisin cakes. It's our rebellion against God. And if we're going to fight for our marriage and if we're going to move from selfish upstream to contract to one flesh, if we're going to do that, we can't not deal with our own raisin cakes. We've got to own it. We've got to uh, admit it. We've got to confess it. In all likelihood, we're going to have to ask for help to work through our long-term habits and dysfunctional thinking patterns and the way we look at each other. And we're going to have to deal, though, with our raisin cakes. And for 
for those of you who are married, maybe you are brave enough to look at each other after this talk and say, which pot are we in? And for you maybe to put a a percentage of where you've spent your time over the weeks or months or years that you've been married. But what would happen if you actually talked about it? And if you actually addressed your raisin cakes and you apologized and you confessed and you said, we're gonna ask for help and I'm willing to change and I wanna try and be humble and I wanna put you first. But what would happen if we actually put ourselves in one of these flower pots and say, okay, honey, where do we go from here? God will honor that kind of effort. Uh, Last thing. Is God's invitation to us as it was to Israel to move away from our spiritual rebellion to him and accept his limitless love and his offer to hold us in the hollow of his hand and let no one take us away. To become grafted together with Jesus, saved by his blood, forgiven. He offers his limitless love and he offers his one flesh covenant commitment to us. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I want to pray over our marriages I know in our church family, we've got a lot of great marriages. We've got a lot of one flesh, a lot of contract. We've got some selfish. And I just pray over the marriages of our church that you would keep us growing. If we're in selfish, to climb the hard climb, to swim the hard swim up to contract or from contract up to one flesh. But I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give a fight inside of us to save our marriages and to work on them, to own our stuff, to apologize and forgive and ask for help and all that it takes, Father. We know that it's a lot of work, but there is not a better place than the one flesh relationship. I also pray that we would leave our raisin cakes as we've turned away from God in little or big ways and we would come back to the limitless love of our Father. If there are those who have, uh, are wanting to start that relationship today, I pray that they in their heart would ask Jesus to forgive them, ask him to reveal his limitless love that was shown through the cross, the forgiveness that comes through the cross and the tomb, and that they would understand that by their faith, they are adopted into God's family. So I I pray for that as well. And in all things, we say thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I got two things to close. The first one is honestly, I don't want this picture to be the one that's seared into your mind. So we have a number of artists in our church and one of them is Caitlin Brown. And Caitlin is a gifted watercolor artist and I have asked her to bring some improvement to my drawing. And so this is it. Uh, These are three beautiful flower pots, including the grafted together one. I want you to remember limitless love and remember the lazy river that will draw you down. So we're going to be highlighting these drawings. There's kind of a before, that's my picture, and then an after, that's Caitlin. So this is going to be each week, so you can look forward to that. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was in this coronavirus world where we have been limited in so many ways, I have been telling you that by God's grace, our mission hasn't changed even though we can't meet together. Our calling to love people hasn't changed even though there's social distancing. Uh, the, The call to worship thankful for digital and online, hasn't changed. Sitting under the teaching of God's word, it hasn't changed. And one thing that we don't want to change is communion. And so next Sunday, 
we will be celebrating communion together, each of us in our homes. We will be explaining this to you in an email this week, how to prep for it. Normally you just walk into the church and it's all ready for you, but we will prepare you for that and it will be a good morning next week as we celebrate communion. So thanks for for watching, God bless. Thank you for joining us today. We would love to stay connected with you throughout the week. Be sure to follow us on Facebook where we're frequently posting stories about how we're connecting with needs in our community. Also, visit firstnbchurch.org slash church online for links for kids, students, for giving online, and to submit prayer requests. Join us again next week.